It's the Untitled Film Project Podcast, Blue Beetle Edition. And oh, and I'm wearing blue. I know. You're, oh, that was totally I'm so unintentional. Ma, so am oh, I. And your so hat, too. Prefer. You have made a statement today. Oh, yeah? Anti-Blue Beetle? Sorry, I'm playing the villain. <laughs> <laughs> the we have uh, Jeremy <laughs> Gopher, Justin Bradford, and Jim Chandler uh, host this week. We're talking about Blue Beetle, uh, the story of a uh, young man who is trying very hard to start his career. Uh, but just as that starts happening, he's fused to an alien scarab that gives him superpowers and uh, we also have our big question of the week which may or may not tie into the reviews of blue beetle which is are the glory days of the superhero movie uh over i i'm gonna answer it from a certain perspective i know we're not there yet okay I'm answer it from a certain perspective and that is are you as the audience are you fatigued by superhero movies. Uh, I think that's that's exactly what we want to know from everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, are we just done with it? So let's uh, get into Blue Beetle. So Blue Beetle, a comic from 1939. It had a little bit of TV coverage, uh, but uh, this is a movie that not a lot of people were familiar with unless they were really steeped in the comic verse. Uh, Let's get initial takes, starting with Jeremy Gover. I thought Blue Beetle was entertaining enough to go to the theater and see. Okay. That is my initial take. That's all you have? <laughs> well, I got more, but you're saving it all for you're the You're saving dive? it for the meat of this program. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was expecting at least three sentences. But you know what? That uh, it, You're not saying so much says something in itself. Fine. You pulled it out of me. It's okay. We have seen all of this before. <laughs> that is my initial take on Blue Beetle. Okay. That, that gives a little bit more. Okay. Thank you for, for providing our listeners you're, with something. You're more, I'm glad I can provide some value on the show. Some value. We were going to replace you for horror. That's true. So we'll replace you for Blue Beetle. <laughs> All right. Justin Bradford, an initial take, Blue Beetle. So, tailgating on what Mr. Gover said. <laughs> oh, for a second there, I thought you tailgated before you went into the Sorry, movie. I like, well, you liked it that much and you didn't wear blue today? He's break checking me here. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised because I had such low expectations going in. It had all the superhero tropes we're used to seeing going yep. right along yep. with what mm-hmm. Mr. Gover has said. Mm-hmm. But I did have low expectations. So overall, I'm going, huh, okay, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And and that's okay. And that's actually a bad thing because the marketing for it was pretty bad. Sure. The lead into it was pretty bad. We know DC's going through this whole transition process. So we don't necessarily know exactly what they're planning to do with Blue Beetle in the future. But I was pleasantly surprised. I think it was charming. And the charming came from Joel Maraduena's character and his role and his portrayal as Jaime. Uh, and so I liked him overall in this role too. Oh, uh, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have some beef. We're going to have some Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm just teasing it, but given, it's, ha- it's going to happen. Given how he portrayed it, I liked him because he was fairly charming in his role. The focus on family was different from what we've seen from other superhero origin stories where they basically have the family taken out of things, and it's family, like oh. Fast and Furious. Yeah. I have I was, it in my I review that I, I posted know. on TikTok. I know, I know, you can I know, go I know. watch that on my channel. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Decent battle scenes. I felt the battle scenes weren't overall rushed like what we got in, uh, what, Secret Invasion, where all of a sudden it's just over before it even started in a sure. battle scene. With nobody else on screen. With nobody else on screen. The that. weakest part for me was Susan Sarandon, which I hate to say that, Interesting. but very weak villain. Very, very, very weak villain. It just made you roll your eyes. It reminded me of a late 90s, early 2000s superhero movie villain. We're like, you're, we know you're going to lose. There's no stakes for you. We know you're going to fail. <laughs> uh, but again, had everything we've seen before, but it was decent enough to be able to go see it in a movie theater and have an enjoyable experience, even though it's not something that's just going to blow you away. So this is Jim, and I also had low expectations. How many times have we said that for a movie <laughs> this year, especially a superhero movie, uh, where we go, well, gee, I went in not thinking it was going to be any good, and sometimes it wasn't, sometimes it was. Uh, this is a movie that I found uh, pretty likable um, for the reasons that they made this movie differently than others. I really liked it, 
And I'll get into what those are in just a little bit. For all the things they did that have been in every single movie for the past 15 to 18 years, I, it, that bothered me. Uh, so, you know, while it has, the, we can put compliments and disses all into this movie, and it's going to be sort of a complicated review. So I, overall, I kind of liked it, and I enjoyed myself. So there's my initial take. So let's get into the main part of our review of Blue Beetle and uh, what it has done differently and what it has done uh, the same as all the other movies. I'm going to kick us off here and just say uh, my beef with your initial take, Justin, uh, in loving Sholo's uh, performance, that he was actually really good in his performance, but his character was not written to be the star of this film. Um, And I, you know, there's nothing he did wrong. But what they did right in this movie is focus on his family. And what I loved that they did differently in Blue Beetle than they did with most other movies, uh, most of the time, the main character attains a superpower and has to hide it from everybody, including or especially their family, Mm -hmm. okay? Here, the family was completely a part of it. I loved how everybody's life was the family's life. And they were, I mean, just the scene of them sending him off to like, you know, go get his job in front of the Cord Corporation (laughs) where the whole family's there, you know, mom's in a, you know, house dress and, you know, like, have a good day. You're going to be great. I I, I loved that that the whole family was a part of it uh, because I was really getting tired of the, I've got to keep this a secret. They were all in it with him which is, I think, culturally is one of the most beautiful things uh, that they could have displayed. Uh, I loved that representation of how family was not just, you know, it's all about family, like uh, Fast and Furious, uh, where, you know, basically it's, you know, we're having a taco with grandma, then she's not a part of it anymore. Uh, This movie embraced uh, the culture's family and, and the importance of it. And every time the family was on screen, they were the main character, I felt. And that's what I really liked about Blue Beetle. I'll give that its like main props right there. So when you said he had beef, it's not like full beef. It's kind of like fast food beef. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it was... not. It's not a major problem. It was just different, in that the main character wasn't necessarily always the main character. The way, uh, the way that it was written, because there were more people. Yes. that it was more. My beef is more with you calling him the main character because I didn't think he was. Mm. Oh, for what's yeah. the title of the movie, Jim? Uh, Blue Beetle. Oh, okay. So who's, I say, who's Blue Beetle? The Scarab. <laughs> Dear, I'm not going to concede this to you. I know you're not. Cause I can, <laughs> you're, you're doing like the old man stubborn right now in your face. <laughs> you're not going to cross this line. That's right. <laughs> so, so to go on with the, the Latin culture representation as well. And so for those that are watching and listening, I'm half Filipino. We have a cousin connection. To, okay. to Latin America, to, to Mexico, when you think of in history, right? Mm-hmm. Spain conquered all of us. So we right. have... <laughs> yeah! Oh. <laughs> Not a good look. <laughs> so there's so many connections when it comes to food, comes to language, comes to just those those characterizations of, of the culture. And there's so many little things that I did enjoy about this movie of putting in things that if you know, you know. When it comes to the culture. And that's what I love about this. That's what I loved about Shang-Chi. That's what I love about when you have African-American cultures being represented as well, too. In a film like this, you're seeing things that if you know, you know. And the one thing that got me when it came to the family aspect of when he, when, when Jaime is knocked out and they take that bottle of Vicks vapor rub <laughs> and put it under his nose, because that is a Filipino thing too. Uh, yeah, and it's just one of those like that's the smelling salt, not true smelling salts. It's Vicks. Vicks is used to cure anything. I learned that from my audience that <laughs> yes. I was sitting there watching the movie with because first of all, I thought it was funny anyway. Oh yeah. But then I realized from who was laughing that it was very much a part of the culture. I was busting up. And, and I was like, because they were, I mean, yeah, they just lost it. I lost it. The only thing I was waiting for was for them to rub it on his feet and then put socks on it. <laughs> and like, you're cured, Jaime. <laughs> 
like that is the, the, the family aspect there too because mom's always going to take care of everything too so I, I did love that that the that family was included and that was such a big part of this movie and throughout the whole film it wasn't just a small section yeah. it was the whole movie family played an incredible role in this from from Nana with the gun <laughs> all the way through and to, to kind of add on that before I finish up my point is George Lopez I had a feeling I wasn't sure about him being cast in I, the role I'll, of kooky uncle I also had a little reservation in there I yeah. was not sure and granted I wouldn't call him necessarily a scene stealer but I thought he blended in as the kooky uncle instead of trying to take over a scene there yeah. were a few moments where I got that feel that that's what it was almost going for but I felt more comfortable after finishing the film of his role in this because I really thought oh man you're putting George Lopez in this role that he might try to steal the scene not right. consciously but just with the way he characterizes himself in roles sure. but he didn't I felt like he fit into that family aspect of what role he was playing in the family and I, I think when he did those uh, jokes where and he's he's inserted in the situation but he's not the focus uh his jokes landed yeah you know like uh when they make a the reference to batman he's like he's fascist yeah. you know like <laughs> there's, there's two words but right i chuckled out loud yeah. i thought yeah. it was uh, very well done justin bradford you <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i'm looking right at him i know Jeremy Gover. I would have changed the name on the bottom of my panel. <laughs> the YouTube version just for that. Uh, th- uh, let's about George Lopez for a second. So I'm not a big George Lopez fan. I, I'm, I'm a big stand-up comedy fan, as you guys know, right? I mm-hmm. love stand-up mm-hmm. comedy. Never been a big George Lopez fan. He's hit or miss for me, mostly miss. And a lot of his jokes are just kind of predictable and blah. In this, he surprised me. When he came on screen, because I forgot he was in this, when he came on screen, I was like, oh, crime, when he, here we go. <laughs> and he actually had five or six lines or pieces of dialogue that went back and forth that were pretty funny. And yeah. I was shocked by that. I do attribute the fart gun of the bug machine, though, to him. Mm-hmm. And that <laughs> to me erases was, just about all the points. That, that was a lazy joke. I really it thought it, it didn't belong. It but, stuck out. But I think it's symbolic. Right. Or yes, yet another example of the poor writing of this movie. Right. Like overall, I think it was, it was written very well, definitely from a, a Latin culture perspective. Right. Family is central and, and everything meaningful, meaningful and impactful of every aspect of your life. And it was written like that. You said earlier, Shola wasn't necessarily the main character. It was actually like he, he was the, or wasn't the lead actor. It was actually the family was the lead, like the lead because it was a almost like a moving piece. It was yes. very fluid. That's excellent writing. To be able to pull that off is very hard to do. Yeah. Not just centralize on one or two characters, but actually like a whole group of people. So that was pretty awesome. But at the same time, there were certain things that were so lazy and so stupid and so bad. And one of those is the fact that we, like I said in my initial takes, what I eventually said in my initial takes, is we've <laughs> seen all this before. Yes. Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Black Panther, I kept a list. Black Panther, Spider-Man Homecoming, Guardians 3, Ms. Marvel, Moon Knight, and Black Widow. All of those movies had some sort of mirroring in this movie. Absolutely. So it was whether it was the superhero landing, which I understand is stereotypical, and maybe you don't attribute to Black Widow, but they made a deal about it in Black Widow, like why yeah. do you land like this? Like, that was f- funny, right? So when I now that I see that in anything, I think, oh, Black Widow, right? So Black Widow, Moon Knight is the scarab. I mean, obviously, okay. right? Ms. Marvel, the big huge fist that she comes uh, out with, that was in there. Mm-hmm. Guardians three, when he goes, not your time yet, and then sends him back to that was in there. Uh, 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 Black Panther, when he's on the ancestral plane, he's talking with his dad. That's in there. Mm -hmm. Iron Man, the POV of his mask. That's in there. uh, Falling from space uncontrollably down because the suit is malfunctioned. That's in there. I mean, it's just so many. Homecoming, where he's learning to use the suit and there's the lady in his ear and he doesn't know how to talk to her. That's all in there. It's so recycled. This movie is recycled. And that is is the biggest problem with Blue Beetle because at the end of the day, when I went, it was fine. In the theater, it was fine. And my son had a good time. I was surprised because I thought it was going to be a big steaming hot pile of dog trash. <laughs> and it was it was like, okay, like I actually enjoyed myself for an hour and a half, and I kind of can't believe it. That being said, you showed me nothing new. Nothing. Everything was recycled from other movies. Not yeah. 
your movies either, by the way. You took all the kind of highlights from Marvel, your main competitor. The and very successful ones. into one movie. Yeah. And then it was just, you didn't show me anything new. I, I hated that. Hated that. They're just preparing for the Capcom special Marvel versus DC. That's enough. <laughs> I want to jump on to the uh, Susan Sarandon uh, because, I mean, besides George Lopez, she's one of, like, the most notable names. I mean, she's, you know, talking, she's been part of the Academy conversation with awards and nominations for years. We just haven't seen her as much lately. But uh, when I found out she was going to be in it and she was going to be kind of the villain, I thought, okay, well, I appreciate you getting a quality actress. We didn't get a quality actress's performance from Susan Sarandon. Uh, you mentioned it like the 90s. I, I, she almost gave me like silent film star overacting with her villain <laughs> take. Interesting. And I, I, it was so over the top and I thought one dimensional that I was really disappointed. I said, wow, I can't believe she just gave that performance. It just looked silly. One dimensional is exactly the way to put it because there's no depth to the villain. There's no reason why more than just like my brother took everything from me. That's yeah. That's really because he was a man. Don't forget that. Right. Because he was a man. Yeah. And not because you're crazy. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like there, there obviously where there was reasons why that side of the family didn't want her to touch anything because of what she was doing, and that's not enough for villains nowadays. We want we want more. And it's not just the, the Marvel thing or the DC thing. It's we want death of a villain because we want a villain to where we can understand the reasons why they're doing what they do, yep. but it's the wrong way they're going about it. We want someone that we can mo- almost relate to and feel for them, not in an empathetic way, but be like, yeah, that that's not the way to do it. Just like Killmonger. Right. Killmonger is a fantastic villain in Black Panther because you see why he's doing what he's doing because he's been built to do that. You understand how he got there. You understand his villain arc. You understand why he's a villain. Here, you don't understand why she's a villain or what she's doing, why there's no empathy, but other people around her gain empathy throughout the film. Uh, so it's that's why it's such a weak villain. This, she's a villain for the sake of being a villain, and it gives very cartoony nature to it. Yeah, and you, and you are right. That's how in, in the corporate uh, CEO entrepreneur villain was like an 80s and 90s trope. Yeah. Right? I mean, like you have, it's like a RoboCop you know, the, the, you know, kind of thing like that. Shout out to Peter Weller. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, like it, there, there are some good comparisons there that, is, that now that you mentioned that, um, that I would, she, this movie deserved a lot better. Um, I affect, I forget the name of, uh, you know, her henchman that, uh, you know, started getting the Carabax. scarab juice. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> milking him, right? <laughs> ah, good one. <laughs> Splinter would have warned him about yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, but Milk Master Three Thousand. <laughs> but at least you know, for him, we got a pretty good story arc when we got one back through his memories. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, because like all of a sudden we started seeing like stuff that actually happened in real life. You know, when you know. Uh, uh, you know, countries went in and they trained locals to be their fighters in different countries. And, you know, the United States and a whole bunch of other countries actually did that. And and that is a part of history and the history of a lot of cultures. And I thought, like, oh, that's, that's like, they gave him a much better yes. reason to be than they did Susan Sarandon's, you know, head of cord, you know. And, and it wasn't exposition based either. Like we did see the flashback and they did talk about it at the party. Yeah. Do you remember when I found you? And I was like, oh, this is the this is what we're getting. And then yeah. you actually get the nice like, oh reveal when he's go cycling through his memories and, yep. and you, yeah. oh, it okay. explains why he is the way that he is. Yes. I probably would have put that a little bit earlier in the movie, but that's that's very, very nitpicky. I'm fine with that. So, right. But my point is it wasn't just exposition. It wasn't just her telling him the story. Right. Mm-hmm. Therefore, telling the audience the story. Right. It was like, oh, okay. Like, we actually saw it later. And it was right. like, all right. And it actually got to my heart for about a split second. I was like, yes. oh, lost his family. Did this, this, this. this it makes sense. Right. And he was groomed. Carapac was groomed yes. by Susan Sarandon's character for that. And then you ex- they explain so much more of why yes. he is. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Jaime understood that. 
because he could, you know, they were connected Mm -hmm. and, you know, which explains, you know, why he, he holds up even when he's at his most angry in this movie and allows him to live because he's like, no, it's more complicated than just, you know, good versus evil. And so angry because he thought his uncle was also killed by court. Yeah, Mm -hmm. not just father, but also uncle. We realize that George Lopez's character is still alive, but he's thinking two deaths have been caused, and he still holds back. Yeah, yeah, because that connection that was made. Yes, and that and I did think it was kind of fun that he was, uh, you know, as the Blue Beetle, the one who tried to harm anyone the least. His family didn't give a crap. They were like, (laughs) "Must mow people down." I know. Blue Beetle, let's get to scores, starting with Jeremy Gover. Acting was great, you guys. I loved the performances of all these people that were no names, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, don't, you, you don't hear of you heard Sarandon, when I think was kind of brought in, as we talked about, to kind of be the heavy hitter, because she's an Oscar winner. She's a multi-Golden Globe winner. Like, you just say, okay, hey, let's bring her in, attach sure. her to this project, and watch her phone it in. But that's <laughs> not what I'm here to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> so and then of course George Lopez, you know, kind of com- comedic relief, whatever. But the other cast, the actual cast that mattered, yeah, was pretty good. I thought they were pretty good. Uh, they did well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, representation of Latin culture demographic was excellent. I love seeing that, especially again in the way that they presented it. It wasn't just like, oh, here's a Mexican superhero because we have to tick that box, and he the Mexican people don't have that. It wasn't like that. It was like, oh. There's a family dynamic. It's very, very, very important to Latin cultures. Like they, they, they made it everything about that. Yeah, so that was that was excellent. George Lopez was actually funny. Like I said, not a big fan of his. He actually had some good lines. Susan Sarandon phoned it in. Like I said, and I did not. And I hated that it was so recycled that all these other projects in of in its competitor were brought into this one and kind of almost like made like a greatest hits album. It's basically kind of Ooh. what it was like. Okay, but here's my main problem. And I will admit that it is nitpicky to a degree. I'm, I'm only taking half a point off for it. That's what I mean by that. <laughs> but thank you for being you. But it, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> half a point off. Thank you for letting me be me. <laughs> but I, I, this is an honest question. I want the listeners to weigh in on this. I want you guys to weigh in on it. Because I don't know if I'm just being go over turning into an old man or if it's, or if it really is a problem. Okay. Because okay. it really, really bothered me in the movie. Okay. Do you remember? When Jaime Reyes walks into Court Industries and he goes up to the receptionist's office, he doesn't have an appointment because she just Jenny told him to come by, right? Yeah. So he goes up to the receptionist and he says, and she goes, "Hi, what's your name?" And he goes, "Jaime Reyes." And she goes, "Okay, Jamie, um, you'll be there. Uh, you'll be, just go have a seat." And he goes, "No, no, no, it's Jaime." She goes, "Okay, Jamie, go have a seat." Here's the problem with this: the spirit of that. Is one hundred percent true. We all know that. Sure. The white entitled Americanized. I'm going to say ben- it. You're beneath the me. way I want to say right. it. Right. That is one hundred percent true. It is happens. It happens every day. Multiple. Okay. Sure. I, I'm not denying that. What bothered me is how they did it. He didn't write his name down on a log to check in. She mm-hmm. reads it. Heim. Uh, she reads it. Jamie. Jamie or Jamie. And he goes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Jaime. Okay. Right this way. Jamie. That's how you do that scene, because she's reading it, Americanizing it, right. entitlizing it, however you want to say that, <laughs> I get okay, you. white privileging it, and saying, J- Jamie, he then corrects her, she dismisses him, almost like she doesn't have time for that, Jamie, you're going to go sit over here. That's how you do the scene. He said his name, Jaime Reyes, and she came back with, Jamie, no one does that. That escapes all logic to me. So that's what I'd like your opinion on. Is that logical or Dang not? It, I freaking agree with Gover. I hate this I hate that situation I that I am agreeing with you as well. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's something I didn't pick up on, but now that you're making me think about it again, I'm like, oh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Like, okay, I that was lazy writing. It, it's even like, it, for instance, Starbucks, you say, hi, May, and they go, how do you spell that? And they write out. Jamie as yeah. the English pronunciation of it, sure. and then the person reads it out as Jamie. It's like, yes. oh, time it. At least it's written out. But you're right; people repeat what they hear. Yes, and that's typically what you would do. You, no matter how it's spelled, that's right. It could be McKinsley, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Right. You right. know, really popular white name there is right now. Yes, 
and you spell it differently, but it's still said the same way. Right. People repeat what they hear, but when they read it, it is different. So I 100% agree with okay. you that they should have had that scene to where he hands a card or there's something written down that has the spelling on it, and she mispronounces that way and then still does it after he corrects her with the pronunciation that's of it that, and hearing it. Yes, that's yeah. the correct way to do it. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And as, Dang. you know, three <laughs> three idiots sitting in a room, we shouldn't be the one noticing and picking up on that and cr- trying to correct it. It should have been the filmmakers, right? Yes. Yeah. No, and that's, I think that is the root of this problem is, yes, I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, it was a racist. Run. Okay, whatever. But, but I'm not doing all that. I'm just saying that I get what they were trying to do, mm-hmm. but at nowhere in the process was it noticed, oh, he doesn't actually write it down. She's being overtly racist. Like, but it's not her. It's not the character. It's the writing. The writing looks, yeah. you're trying to make a point. And you're not doing it the right way. Right. And no one along the way decided, hey, maybe he should write it down. She grabs the clipboard and goes, okay, Jamie, sit over there. It's Jaime. Okay, Jamie, go sit over there. That solves the entire problem, and it takes no extra time. It's a detail. Just a it detail. Is, it's yeah. a detail yeah. uh, that shouldn't have been missed. Yeah. So, okay. I agree. so I'll give you that. Thank you. I appreciate you backing me up on that. But I would like to hear the listeners, too. Am I, am I just being... You know, middle-aged white guy getting old? Or, or is it... Am it's I really? not knowing how to land a joke. No, 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 no. Properly. So I will not even let you say middle-aged white guy not getting a joke because you're picking up something that is important, that if you're going to put that in there, they have to get the detail right so people can connect to it more. Yeah. So that's not... Don't even try to downplay yourself of picking that okay. up because the reason why you're picking that up is because you're aware. And that's very important. I would love to think that's that you true. are aware of it because when you notice that that's the reasons, like then you notice when people do that, that's when they're being rooted and considerate. It doesn't make any sense that when somebody hears something, they don't repeat it because right. they're not just purposely saying that. Because who has who has never heard a Spanish language way of saying Jamie before would instantly say, "Oh, it's Jamie." They would think it's spelled some other way. Right. So you recognizing that shows so much more value of what you're given in social community and culture that I would never want you to downplay yourself on not okay. picking well, it up. Well, I appreciate it. that. Now I'm glad I brought it up. I was yes. really nervous about bringing it up on and, the way here. And you're, I'm just playing being, you've already established you're a fan of comedians. So you know how uh, a point or a joke has to be properly set up has for to it to, to land correctly. If you add one or two words... It will not it, land the same as if you it changes take those it words completely. Out. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, at the end of the day, again, I enjoyed myself at the movie theater. I was surprised by that. My son enjoyed himself. Blue Beetle gets a 5.5 for me. Okay. Let's uh, go to Justin Bradford. What is your score for Blue Beetle and why? All right. So, Blue Beetle, I'm, I'm curious of what's going to happen with the future Blue Beetle, given how we had that mid credit scene and they're diving into something that could be further storylines. But we don't know with James Gunn taking over if they're going to fu- do future exploration of Blue Beetle. So I'm looking at it as a standalone film right now and what they're trying to do. And I feel like as an origin story overall, yes, we saw every superhero trope. We saw everything we've seen in the moment of the theater. I did enjoy myself. I was pleasantly surprised. The Susan Sarandon villain definitely takes points and Gover's yep. words off mm-hmm. for me because it was not a good villain. But the family aspect makes up for that for me. So it's like almost a wash <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> right. The representation of not just having people of a certain skin tone and culture on, but actually diving in and making sure because of the filmmakers being of Latin culture. Yes. Having those little itty bitty things in there from whether it's the family layout of having a multi generational family living in one household. Yep which is big, having the Vicks Vaporub moment, having the little things in Spanish that weren't subtitled because it has to yes. be that if you know, you know. And if you call. understand, you understand. Mm-hmm. It's like we are paying homage to the culture and that you're going to get this joke, but it's not for everybody. This is for you. We are representing you here, and we don't have to subtitle this because sometimes it can't be subtitled properly either. Yeah. There's no direct translation uh, to things as well. So I loved that aspect of it. George Lopez Better than I thought he would be. I thought Joel Maradueña. I thought he was good in his role. And, and obviously, this is a big breakout role from him, from Cobra Kai, yeah. now to big-time movies as well. So it's going to open up opportunities for him. Uh, overall, since I enjoyed it, I give it a 6.5. Okay. Okay. This is Jim. And uh, if I'm just going to boil this down scientifically, mathematically by points, uh, I would have to say that uh, what the score you're going to get is 
the effort by the filmmakers and the actors uh, to portray a really likable, realistic family. Yeah, sure, kind of turned up a few notches, you know, for comedic and dramatic effect. But it just, I, I felt like I knew these people. And I really enjoyed the way they made this a family movie, not in the way that the, it's for a family audience, but this is a movie about a family. Uh, so, you know, Shalom Aradwine, who did a great job. He just wasn't the focus for me. He was kind of like, uh, he moved it along for the whole family uh, and what happens to him becoming Blue Beetle. Uh, so... All that stuff I loved, and all the points that this movie gets from me are from those things. Everything that you like, you know, detract from a perfect score of 10 is going to be because they just jammed in every one of those stereotypes from every famous, you know, superhero movie. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> There's there's ten more that you didn't mention. I'm sure there are that, that I you know that were going through my head. Like you know, I'm like ah yeah, he's got a super suit. You know, like it was like <laughs> the Incredibles. I remembered uh, there were so many more. So I'm giving uh, Blue Beetle, even though I walked out of there with a smile on my face uh, and I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, I'm not going to think about it forever. Uh, I'm going to give it a six point five, and that goes completely to the cast of this movie and the people who developed that cast and portrayed them and, you know, both uh, in front of and behind the camera. And that other three and a half is just being lopped off because you just took stuff from other movies and in that part you were wasting our time. And you wasted the good parts of this movie by tr throwing it away with garbage at the end. So 6.5, too bad. Could have been better. That's the worst compliment, I think. <laughs> but also could have been way worse. No, true. But I'm saying if you're a filmmaker, and I, this is just a throwaway comment. If you're a filmmaker and you get a review that says could have been better, that means you left a lot on the table. And you had a chance. And you had a chance. It's the I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, it. that's, 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 that's it. Oh, great. gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to oh, use that in the promo. That's yeah, good. Yeah, Dad, Dad was, I thought he was going to yell at me, and he didn't. It was worse. <laughs> All right, it's time uh, for the big question on the Untitled Film Project podcast. Uh, I threw out there, is the golden age of the superhero movie over? Okay, and, you know, we, we, we can debate. Uh, Jeremy, you mentioned, is it over for us or because we're fatigued? Or is it over for another reason? Is, is just where are we at on the, on the curve of popularity and buzz on superhero movies. I'm going to go a little bit left of center here. Okay. I think we are past the golden era or whatever of superhero movies because those eras only last so long. And we got 15 really great. I mean, like great, like redefining the genre. Great. Movies. Changed movies and box yes. offices and uh, the way studios did everything. Correct. For 15 years, uh, maybe a little bit more. So, I mean, you could throw in the Dark Knight trilogy, which would be before that 15 years, right, mm -hmm. right, right before it. Or even the Tobey totally Maguire Spider-Man would be, you know, uh, you could. stretching it a bit. But yeah. really, it began with Iron Man. It began with Iron Man, right. Yeah. So if you think of that, you, to me, it's not fatigue of the genre, okay? I think the problem is the homework involved, it's the fact that they all interweave with each other, or they try to, and it's it, all of a sudden instead of a standalone film or maybe a trilogy or maybe if you're really lucky, maybe like a five or a six movie saga. Mm -hmm. Now you have to watch twenty five movies and sixteen TV shows, and then these three internet shorts, and then these three and the end credits from yeah, another the, unrelated right, thing, right? And then all of a sudden, at, and then then it culminates in this one. So it's the homework involved. People are busy. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say that my schedule is like everybody else's schedule, but I can tell you, I have a day job, I have two podcasts, I have a t I have two part time jobs, okay, and I have a family to take care of. Right. So I am busy. I don't have time 
to watch all the things I even want to watch. It's not like, oh, hey, this movie came in the mail. You need to review it for the site. Okay, I mean, I'll find two hours to do. I'll stay up late one night or you know whatever it is, right? All right. But to actually pay attention and focus and be like, okay, that connects with that movie seven years ago, and then that character was teased the movie two movies before that, and then this loan of dialogue is a callback to the like. It's so impressive. But it, it's such an amount of homework it's a for the audience. And so, therefore, you cannot necessarily go to a movie anymore. You can. Like, Shang-Chi is a great example. That's a great superhero movie that is pretty much standalone. Yeah. For now. And that's how it should be. Right. It's the standalone. I can go enjoy that by itself. I haven't seen anything else. I don't have to care that Tony Slattery or whatever that guy's name was. His name is Tony Slattery. Is actually, whose lines in any way artist? But <laughs> the, who's, what's the? It's, whatever, whatever Ben Kingsley played, Slattery, Slattery. Right. I don't have to know that he was in Iron Man <laughs> two or three. Right. I don't have to know that. Right. Okay. I can just watch the movie as is. You just come in with your popcorn, sit down, and enjoy it. And enjoy it. Right. I don't have to pay attention. That's how they should be. Because it's an origin story, though. We're, Yes, but it still is not with this other character. And this, this is a, so that is great to me. That's what it, a new superhero movie should be like. It's a standalone that eventually culminates. And I think the amount of homework that is involved to go enjoy these movies, I think that is what's fatiguing. It's not the genre. It's the fact that we have to make everything just interweaving with this and that. That's the problem. A, they're trying to. They have to make it a giant universe. Yeah. Okay. And then now you you've added in this. <clears throat> excuse me. I hope I'm not stealing a base thunder here, but now you're adding in the multiverse part, which is super confusing. And, yeah. And to the point where I'm a Marvel fan. I love the MCU. I love the fact. I think it's a masterpiece. I've talked about it on the show before. I think the fact that Infinity War and Endgame, if you take them as one movie, it is a masterpiece. And how they were able to sum up 23 films into one film, all the characters that just that is mind blowingly amazing to me over that amount of time. So I love the MCU, even the projects that aren't great, like Secret Invasion. I love Secret Invasion until the last episode, but I'm still like, oh, how's that going to play into the, mis- into the Marvels coming out? Right. I still do that. I'm still interested. I don't care. <laughs> about them, I just don't about the multiverse. It's cool. You can present it to me. I'm like, okay, I kind of get it. But I don't. I don't. My brain doesn't work like that. And so, if my brain doesn't work like that, and I'm invested, Joe and Betty and Brittany and <laughs> Carlos down the street are. They don't care. McKinsley. Yeah. Thank you. A good callback. <laughs> McKinsley doesn't. They don't. They're not going to care. Right. They're just not going to care. And therefore, you're not going to see these one billion dollar gross box office sales or these $500 million box office sales on these big budget movies anymore because you've fatigued the audience with the homework, not the genre. Uh, I can't disagree. I disagree with some parts. Uh, I, but tell Giddy me how up. you, because I do feel like it is homework before I have to see, you know, go see a movie that is a big release. Why don't you uh, feel that that, Go- Gover's take on so, this being too much work. Shang Chi is right. it's not about the, the 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 work part. It's about origin stories because you can only have so many origin stories come out, and a lot of origin stories are connected to other things, which is why. So, for instance, people will say, "Well, the MCU ended at, with Endgame," which I can't agree with that because I feel like there's some ridiculous expectations that people have put in their heads of what to expect after a moment. Mm -hmm. in genre history like Endgame. But there have been some great projects that have come out that do tell origin stories, but also pass the torch as well. And a lot of that's with the TV show. So Miss Marvel, that's an origin story. I love Miss Marvel. There's It's a good series. You you don't have to necessarily have any background on much to enjoy Miss Marvel. Now it does connect to the Marvels that are coming out at the end. But in terms of homework, you wouldn't need it. Loki, yeah. yeah. A little bit of homework, but overall, that's a different type of origin story with the multiverse. Shang-Chi, origin story. Eternals, still an origin story, but it it wasn't wasn't as strong of a movie, but still an origin story. She-Hulk, very loosely connected origin story. Mm -hmm. We are getting a lot of those. I think the fatigue is coming in when they're putting too much out as well. So it's the the amount of product they're putting out like in a given year. In a given year because you think before when you would have six to eight months to do your homework, Mm -hmm. that was time to play catch up. Now it's three to four months. 
to be able to play catch up between right. projects coming out. So I think a lot of the fatigue is coming in that, yes, not everything's going to be a banger. And you look back at, you know, phase one through three, not everything was a banger. No, sure. Right. But because you knew they're building to something bigger, right. you were invested, right? Everybody's invested. So I think that's the thing now is that we had this, this, the pandemic obviously did not help a lot of things. That that put a pause on things, it put a pause in production, it put a hurt on writing and production as well. And we're still trying to get out of that with the entertainment we're receiving now. Plus, you add the strike into that, that is going right. to suffer with the projects we get out. There's so many that have been canceled that aren't necessarily superhero related, but it all it all runs together. And then plus the way the CGI creators have been, you know, handled through Marvel and everything as well. Now they've been pushing fatigued. out projects. Yeah, they've been fatigued. Yes. <laughs> so. It comes down to people's expectations are they want a banger every single time, but it's because they're putting out every three to four months, you're getting something new, something new because they're rushing things so much. And that's why even She-Hulk poked fun at that about, yes. oh, no, you need to go focus on Black Panther behind it forever now. We're talking <laughs> about CGI here. Which I would argue is the only reason that show worked. Yeah, the, the I love She-Hulk. I, I yeah. love the show, but because it was so self-effacing. Self, yes, self-aware helps so much yeah. in these things. But I'm looking at Phase 4 and the beginning of Phase 5. There are some great projects out of Phase 4, like Shang-Chi, I thought was incredible. It's a great movie. WandaVision, just exploring the depth of loss and depression. I love the exploration Amazing of that. television. Multiverse of Madness, mm, not so much. Mm. But Spider-Man, No Way Home. Oh, amazing. It's like, a great movie. You think about the theater moment, and that's you, people yeah. go back to Endgame when it comes to theater moments. The mm -hmm. moments we see the other Spider-Man on the screen, yeah. the moments in a packed theater... Close, not the same, but close to end game levels. Yeah, in terms collective of how gasps yes. or laughs. Or even though we knew part of it was coming, we, we just had that feeling it was coming. We didn't know for sure yet until things got leaked. But but when it happened, people just erupted, and it was amazing. We've had some great projects, so I'm not necessarily calling a fatigue from it being poor creations. Even though not everything's a banger, I think it's fatigue because they're rushing projects too much okay. and putting too much out in one year when right. it wasn't like that before. So like a factory is is pushing out more cars than they ever were, and guess what? There's more defects. And there's a couple of lemons in there. It will be, yes. Okay. Well, I'm gonna Great I'm analogy. gonna I'm gonna I I like that. Uh, I think that's true. I, I do think they're trying to put out too much, uh, and the quality is going to suffer. You're going to have more hits and misses that way. Uh, I'm also going to say that it's also an oversaturation problem on the viewer because we don't get a break to anticipate things. Uh, they are putting out – I mean, Disney – uh, you, I don't think you'd ever really know as a consumer of these things that there was a pandemic and that there was delays for this or that because they're putting out too much stuff. And, you know, I, there's no way to keep up with it all. And I, I think because we're getting so much, we're feeling it's the more this, it's more of the same. It's like if mom has a favorite dinner that you just love when she makes it. <laughs> now, if she's making it six days a week, mm -hmm. it's not your favorite dinner anymore. Right. Now it's like, uh, uh, again? So uh, it, to me, I think it's uh, they're putting out too much stuff from too many studios, even just from one place, from Disney, they put out too much stuff, but you've got other studios trying to do it, and they're all trying to get the next great franchise. <laughs> So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Is the golden era of the superhero movie over? Uh, and if it is, why? Uh, was it one of the reasons that we said? Or is it something that you've been saying all along? You're going, guys, you missed it completely. Let us know. Justin, tell them where to find us. Oh, untitledfilmprojectpod.com is our website. And then also everywhere in social media, uh, Twitter, X, whatever the hell. Always. Dumb Dumb wants to call <laughs> Twitter. it. Twitter. Uh, Instagram. <laughs> TikTok, Facebook, that's where you can find us. Thanks. Yeah, reach out to us and uh, hit us with your takes. We'd love to hear them. We interact with you. We've been reviewing Blue Beetle. Thanks for hanging out with us on the Untitled Film Project podcast. Yeah, we'll see you next time. And uh, I can't wait for Equalizer 3, you guys. I know it's not the next episode, but I just, I'm so pumped. You're the guy. I love it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Untitled Film Project podcast. To support the show, please rate, review, follow, and subscribe. Original music by Jeremy Schwartz. Special thanks to the Music City Film Critics Association.
Editing and post-production by Jeremy K. Gover. Voiceover by Chad Bennett.